Hi, I'm Dan Pinchbeck. I'm the creative director of the Chinese Room. Uh, we made uh, the first person game, Dear Esther, um, which is a first person exploration game. It's very story driven, very music driven. Um, you explore a deserted Scottish island um, and as you do, a very deep abstract story kind of unfolds with a very heavy focus on environmental storytelling, music and uh, the sort of emotional journey of the character. I actually started off as an academic. I've been obviously playing games since I was about seven um, and I started doing a PhD a few years ago at Portsmouth University on the relationship between story and gameplay in first person shooters. I was also a full time teacher at the time and I was finding it very, very difficult to find any time to do any research work because of the teaching commitment. So I applied to the Arts and Humanities Research Council for some grant money to make some experimental games, partially because I thought it would let me kind of manage my own time and partially because at that point in games research there was an awful lot of theory and a lot of people were talking about what games could do and couldn't do and should do and shouldn't do. And I was getting a bit frustrated with that and kind of thought, well, why don't we just kind of actually make the games to find out as opposed to just guess effectively. So we made a bunch of uh, game modifications on different engines. And um, one of these was Dear Esther, which was based on the Half-Life 2 engine. And part of the idea was that we would release these mods out into the wild and people would play them or not play them and tell us what they thought of them probably because it's the internet and people tend to let other people know what they think. But we kind of figured that the responses we got and the data we got back would be really honest and natural and better than sitting someone in a lab asking them what they thought. Um, and Dear Esther went completely insane. It just got thousands and thousands of downloads almost overnight. Um, it's about 100,000 downloads was the final kind of figure we looked at it. And just after we made it, we are moving on to other mods. Uh, a designer called Robert Briscoe, who'd just been working on Mirror's Edge, contacted us and said, I really like what you're doing with the mod, but I'd really think you could do more with the, the art and the environment. Would you mind if I rebuilt it? And um, we kind of knew that the voice and the, the, particularly the music, which had been uh, created by Jessica Curry's co-director of the Chinese Room, was a really, really high standard. And we thought the visuals could do it as well. So Rob started working on that. And a couple of years later, we sort of were looking at this, this mod, which seemed way more than a mod and seemed like it was of a really high quality at this point. And, and kind of the, Jessica and Rob had managed to get AAA production values on a shoestring out of this game. And we kind of all looked at each other and then made the call to, to commercialise it and release it as a game. And I think in the vague hope that we might get some way towards making our money back in terms of what we could have earned if we were working in industry. And instead the game went absolutely through the roof and is now kind of uh, just tipping over 400,000 units, which is an extraordinary amount. Um, and here we are and suddenly we're a, we're a fully fledged commercial studio, which is very strange. My favourite game, um, which I do talk about a lot, is a game called Stalker by GSC Game World, who are a Ukrainian studio. Um, it's a first person shooter based in the Chernobyl exclusion zone, but very loosely based on the Tarkovsky film Stalker, which is based on the Strugatsky Brothers um, novella, Roadside Picnic. For me, no other game has quite the same emotional tone. It captures an intensity and a loneliness and an emptiness and a sadness like no other game has ever managed. Um, it's beautiful and desolate and frightening and it's just such an amazing mix of, of kind of emotions. It's such an extraordinary game. Um, but I love any, actually the, the whole kind of Ukrainian game development scene is amazing. I'm a huge fan of 4A games and Metro uh, 2033, which is one of the best um, first person games of recent years. Um, Pathologic, Ice Pick Lodge's work, which is really strange but absolutely wonderful. They just seem to have a very particular emotional tone they seem to be able to capture in, in I don't know if it is coming from the Ukraine, if it's sort of specifically cultural or geographical, but they kind of make uh, Western shooters look very shallow, I think, a lot of the time, very sort of bombastic. So yeah, GSC, anything by GSC or 4A, make things. I think particularly students, we get asked a lot by students, how do I get into the games industry? And the big thing which come back to them is saying, you just got to make stuff, whether it's, um, if you're a modeler, you've got to make models, you've got to build your portfolio. If you want to be a game designer, you've got to design games and you've got to get them out there. So even if they're short, even if they're not perfect, make something, finish it and deliver it actually out to the public domain because there's a huge gap between having an idea for a game and making a game and there's an even bigger gap between making a game and getting a game to market. If you can get a game to market, studios will be interested in you because you're someone who can deliver, who can finish and lots of people can start, not many people can finish. If you go to a gallery, say if you go and see something like a Rothko painting or a Jackson Pollock 
like in in the flesh, in, in the canvas, whichever way you put it. You don't look at a Jackson Pollock painting and go, which splatter came first? You look at the totality of it and you have an emotional reaction to it. When you're looking at Rothko, you're not thinking about the colour banding, you just have a, a, an atmospheric emotional engagement with it. And I think with Dear Esther, the way I've always thought about the writing in it is it's not, the writing isn't there to be a literal start to finish chain of story. It's there to create a mood and a feel and an atmosphere. And it's a kind of a design tool in the way that the music or the environment is. So it's not, it's less important to me whether people answer Dear Esther or if it makes sense to them. What I care about is do they have the right emotional reaction? Are they engaged by it? Are they uh, kind of immersed in the story and the mood and the feel of it? And that to me is kind of more important than sense, I guess. But it also, what's wonderful as well, is that when you go online onto the forums, there are pages and pages and pages of people unpicking the story. And we never went out of a way to be willfully obtuse or to try and kind of deliberately try and mess with people's heads in that way. But I think I like the idea that you throw it open to the reader or the player and say, well, no, it's, it's, this is, you are constructing this experience yourself. So one of the things that I get frustrated about in games is they, they're very good at opening up the world and, and spinning this amazing world. And they go for about three quarters of the way and suddenly right near the end, they go, oh, and they panic and they crunch everything back down again. And it always ends up with a plot that you go, oh, that's not quite as good as what I thought. Um, I could have done something a bit more interesting in my head with that. It's like the classic horror thing of never show the monster. The moment you show the monster, the game's not scary. And I think one of the reasons that Dear Esther kind of is powerful is because the end of the game is such a personal thing that the player comes up with a very, very, very personalised interpretation. And I think that's where a lot of the emotional punch comes from. Right. That I don't know that we could have delivered by closing the story back down again. Do you know what? We were at um, GD, uh, GDC last year and Nathan Veyer from Cappy, who made uh, Swords and Sorcery, was there. And he said, which I think is one of the most inspirational quotes I've heard in years, and he said, actually, the reality of it now is, if you make a game like everybody else, and you're a small studio, you're going to get lost. So it's less risky to take risks than it is not to take them. So you might as well follow your passion, find your vision, and do something that you believe you're true to. And if someone comes up to you and says, that's a terrible marketing decision, ignore them and make it anyway. Because if you're passionate about it, you'll make a better game. And if it's an idiosyncratic vision, you'll stand out from the crowd. So now is the time for vision. Now's the time for, to take risks and to innovate, absolutely.